Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Mexico Deconstructing the Regulatory State. A very special thank you to our event partner, the Mexican Institute for Competitiveness, INCO. My name, for those of you who don't know, is Marta Blackwell, and I'm the Vice President of the Canadian Council for the Americas. Um, for those of you who don't know us, the CCA is Canada's premier forum for the discussion of issues, economic and political, in the Americas that are of interest to Canadians and Canadian investment throughout the region. This year, we have a full slate of public events as well as private events for our premium members. If anyone's interested in finding out more about our premium membership, please contact us at info at ccacanada.com. I also invite you to visit our website, ccacanada.com, for videos of our previous events, including our latest annual economic and political outlook for the Americas. We had experts from across the region with us for that event, um, and you can find that on our website. So the reason why we're here today, today's event is going to be divided into two parts. The first will be presentations from each of our panelists and the second an open discussion amongst them. Please note that due to time constraints, we ask that you submit any and all of your questions through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panelists. We'll start with um, Miguel Flores Bernes. He's a former commissioner of the Federal Competition Commission and a lecturer at Escuela Libre de Derecho. Irene Levy is president of Observatel, a telecommunications lawyer and the former director general of the Federal Telecoms Commission in Mexico. Maria Marvan Laborde is founding president of the Federal Institute for Information Access and Data Protection and Valeria Moy, Director General of the Mexico Institute for Competitiveness, or INCO. Thanks again, Valeria, for your partnership on this event. And with that, I will actually invite Valeria to, to speak first. I'm going to ask that you start us off with a recent history of the regulatory structure in Mexico and the reasons why it was created. So um, when autonomous bodies were created, what were the ills that they were designed to remedy? So over to you, Valeria. Thank you. Well, good evening. First of all, I'd like to thank the Canadian Council of the Americas and Marta especially for her kind moderation of the event. And of course, our very esteemed panelists. Thank you very much for attending you all this invitation to discuss a topic that has been central in the public debate in the past few months, the future of Mexico's autonomous institutions. Over the past three, maybe four decades, Mexico has developed a system of institutions that are recognized in the constitution as autonomous and independent from the three branches of government, that is from the executive, the legislative, the legislative and the judiciary. The search, the origin of this ecosystem of autonomous institutions responded to various issues. First of all, we needed to have an independent monetary policy that allowed us to keep inflation under control. That was the origin of giving autonomy to Banco de Mexico, our central bank. Second, we have the emergency to develop electoral institutions trusted by candidates and citizens alike in order to enable free and fair elections and trustworthy elections. Then we have the need to ensure that the people can exercise the right to access public information expeditiously. And we have the urgency of creating technical independent regulators of markets that promote competition and rule out monopolistic practices that go against social welfare, among other important issues. Given Mexico's legal system, the solution had been found in what we call autonomia constitucional, this legal figure has been granted to nine autonomous institutions. Banxico, Banco de Mexico, our central bank, INEGI, the statistics agency, Coneval, which is in charge of independent policy, social policy evaluation, and it's the institution that measures the poverty rate. CNDH, La Comisión Nacional de Derechos Humanos, which focuses on human rights. INE, Instituto Nacional Electoral, in charge of elections, basically, the Fiscalía General de la República, that's the federal prosecutor, and the three autonomous institutions we will be discussing today. The National Institute of Access to Information, INAI, the Federal Commission for Economic Competition, COFESE, 
and the Federal Institute of Telecommunications, EFT. Since the beginning of his term, the president of Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador, has repeatedly said that he thinks that those, those particular three institutions, in particular, do not fulfill an important role in society. He does not consider that these three institutions are important to what he calls the Mexico's fourth transformation, whatever that is. He has called them expensive, useless, and actually this is a quote, a simulation created by the neoliberal regime and has called by he, he has called for his for their suppression. When asked who could then fulfill those important functions that the autonomous institutions have, he has responded by saying that his government will do it. His government will be in charge of fulfilling these activities. The regulation activities that COFESE does could be absorbed by the Ministry of Economy, Secretaria de Economía. The functions of the EFT would be pursued by the Secretaria de Comunicaciones, the Ministry of Communications. And the access to information would be simply fulfilled by asking all public servants to respond with any freedom of information request in 72 hours. And the Secretaria of the Función Pública would make sure that this is the case. I seriously doubt that that would work, but that's his idea of presenting this destruction of these institutions. What we are witnessing every time the president attacks EFT, COFESE, and DINAI is, in the view of IMCO, a deliberate attempt to dismantle the regulatory state, thus disabling important checks and balances that may constrain his government. The concept of the state as a regulator is a response to the need to regulate economic activities, understanding the Mexican state has a very important role in the economy and that the human rights are fundamental for the development of the country. This is why these institutions are safeguarded in the most important national law, that is the constitution. The issue that brings us here is that the president discourse has found fertile ground and now there are serious discussions about the future of these institutions. Most Mexicans, and this is, very, this is a very serious issue, most Mexicans are not familiar with the relevance that autonomous institutions have in their daily lives, uh, in part due to the technical nature of their activities and in part due to poor communication strategies by some of those institutions. The president often confronts his audience with his favorite dilemma. We could, ask, we could use all the money spent by INAI to buy vaccines, or we could use all the money that COFESE has to transfer, to, to transfer more money to the elderly. This is a message that has a huge echo, mostly because only a handful of Mexicans know what INAI does and use the information that INAI gives us, or even know the existence of COFESE. But in this public discussion, there has been a lot of misinformation about what autonomous agencies are and what they serve for. Would its elimination really affect the daily life of Mexican citizens? Or as the President López Obrador suggests, it is better to eliminate them because they are very expensive to the state. Of course, at IMCO, we are convinced, seriously convinced that the regulatory state is essential for Mexico competitiveness. By enabling the te telecommunications market to be more competitive and efficient and giving certainty for investors and, and consumers, EFT contributes to create the necessary conditions for Mexico's economy to unleash its potential. By ensuring that firms do not engage in collusion and, collusion and other monopolistic practices, COFESE allows market to come closer to a kind of social efficiency thus benefiting consumers among them, usually the government, that has itself benefit, has been benefited by COFESA's actions regarding public procurement. And by enabling citizens to scrutinize the government's action, INAI, which is incredibly relevant, has contributed to prevent and punish corruption and to enable citizens to make more informed decisions and exercising their rights. These institutions are autonomous because they carry out their functions independently from the president or the party in the government. And we believe this must continue to be the case because these three institutions are certainly useful and necessary. While all of them have flaws, which will be discussed in depth today, they fulfill essential activities that enable Mexico to be a more competitive country. It is also important to note that they are not as expensive as the government says. This is a very important issue. The three autonomous bodies that we are discussing today represent less than 1%, 1% of the federal budget. If we put this budget in perspective, 
we can reassure ourselves that the importance of the regulatory state is enormous. It improves the welfare of citizens as subjects of rights and as consumers. In one phrase, autonomous institutions matter. I want to thank again the Canadian Council for the Americas for organizing this webinar and our panelists today for being here. I look forward to having a great discussion with you. Great, thank you so much, Valeria. Um, I'll move next to with, uh, I'll invite Maria to unmute herself and just uh, to mention, you were the founding president of the Federal Access to Information Institute that then became the National Institute for Transparency, Access to Information and Personal Data Protection. Can you, as Valeria started, can you sort of go deeper into describe what the purpose of INAI wa was when it was created and what ills it meant to um, to fix uh, within the system that was already in place. Maria? Thank you very much, Marta. Thank you very much to, to, to the uh, Canadian Council of, for the Americas for the invitation. And I'm really honored to share the, the, the table with, with all the people that are here now. Uh, INAI was one of the, is one of the key institutions of the transition to democracy. It was founded in 2002, when the new government, the Partido Acción Nacional, uh, won the elections uh, after 71 years of the PRI uh, having kind of democracy, uh, wh where we, ha we have an hegemonic party. And uh, the, the main goal at uh, its foundation was uh, to enable the right to know of all the citizens and in the sense of uh, know what does the government with what money and what are the main decisions that uh, it does in and enable a system in which you can ask the government for documents and they are uh, obliged to uh, respond in time and giving you the information. Uh, the United States or Canada is known as a Freedom of Information Act. It is the equivalent. So, so you that are in, either in, the, in connect, connect Canada or the United States understand what I'm talking about. When the Federal Institute was born in 2002, it was a authority just for the executive, even though the law it set some kind of obligations for the uh, legislative, le the judicial, and the constitutional autonomous bodies as, as well. Uh, it was in 2015 when it changed to a national institute and it becomes authority, not just for the federal government, but uh, for the legislative, the uh, judicial, and uh, all the, the Constitutionales Autonomous. It was designed to reduce the opacity, the lack of transparency in the way the uh, government works. Just to give you an example, uh, several years before its uh, foundation in 1998, uh, a guy asked how much money does the president earn uh, every year or every month? And uh, it was denied the information. It was told that uh, he has, a, it, it was not violating his rights, uh, not knowing uh, what was the income, let's say the salary, it's not exactly a salary, the salary of the Mexican president. And that was uh, true, uh, that, that was true to all uh, posts in the, in the government let alone to know about public procurement and all the contracts and, and all the, the, the things that the government have to, have to buy, we were not able to know under what conditions, what was the cost. Uh, one very good example thinking in, in today's terms will be the vaccines for uh, COVID. Uh, we have had two different laws the one that was approved in 2002 and the other one uh, who 
this one was replaced in 2015 for the general law. So we passed from a federal law to a general law. Uh, I must say that the federal law, uh, it was simpler and it was uh, much, much easier to implement. Uh, in an attempt to establish a, a, a common ground between all the states in Mexico and the, feder and the federal government, uh, we end up in 2015 with a very complex law, uh, much more difficult to understand it, and uh, at the same time, increase the bureaucratic load of work for all the people that have to answer the, uh, the questions, the requests from the people, as well as to put in internet, uh, in a special website, all the information of uh, transparency. I think we have to acknowledge that uh, the uh, journalism, investigative journalist, the journalism that have been developed in our country in the last 15 years, has been a benefit of the uh, Freedom of Information Act and uh, have uh, helped to develop these new skills. I think destruction with a, a cause that the citizens lose a very important tool to enforce uh, accountability to the government. Thank you, Maria, and thanks for that. Um, I'm going to ask Irene. Um, so Irene is going to speak to us about the uh, Telecommunications Institute, uh, the IFT. Um, and in the same way that we asked Maria, Irene, if you could describe to us sort of what the overall purpose is, what the sort of what the issues were that it was designed to remedy. Um, and, and as Maria also mentioned, some of the deficiencies. So what were the, um, what were the deficiencies within in, in, the, in the system that it was meant to, to remedy? Thanks, Irene. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Marta. Uh, hola a todos. Uh, bonjour. Uh, thank you to the uh, CCA and IMCO for the invitation. I live in Canada, I'm in Montreal now, and it's very important for me to share with you some of my thoughts about this critical topic. Um, look, uh, the IFT, uh, the Federal Telecommunications Institute, is a very powerful agency. It uh, grants uh, and revokes concessions, it imposes uh, sanctions, it oversees the planning of a spectrum as well as the protection of important human rights such as the access to information and communication technology, the access to internet. So uh, it's, it's, very, it's very important, it's very powerful. Um, in addition, this institute uh, is the authority with competence on economic competition for the broadcasting and telecommunication sectors. So why we have the, this institute in Mexico? Well, uh, we have to go back in history to the uh, 1996 year when we had uh, this uh, uh, Federal Telecommunications Commission. It was not an independent agency. It was a, a deconcentrated agency uh, that was uh, created in order to solve some of the problems you, we used to have. Um, but it, it wasn't that autonomous. Uh, it only granted technical opinion to the Ministry of Communication. And the ministry had the, the, the power to decide to resolve all of the issues, uh, even grant uh, concessions or re revoke or impose sanctions. So we have, we have at that time some problems. We have discretional decisions take, take, uh, take, uh, taken with political motivation. We have very concentrated, con concentrated, concentrated, sorry, markets. 
we had a high amount of litigation. Every decision was challenged uh, before the Supreme Court because we had this uh, suspension. So it was, we had this incentive to go to the Supreme Court and challenge every decision. We had two big companies controlling telecom and television markets. So we needed, by, by that, that time, we needed uh, new investors. We needed new players. And then the former president, Enrique Peña Nieto, took power. And he, he needed uh, a legitimation. In my opinion, that, uh, that is why, uh, why he started to implement some of the uh, reforms, constitutional reforms, in various areas, not, not only in telecom, but also in energy, in transparency, education, competition. So, he, he tried to send this message. He tried to send the world a message uh, that Mexico was changing and the message was trust Mexico. Uh, so this way, and new investors could think that there would be new rules, predictability, no surprises whatsoever, technical based decision, as Valeria said, uh, and a strong hand with monopolies. But of course, of course, IFT or the other agency, agencies are not perfect. For example, some of the, of the problems, the process for appointing commissioners is not very transparent. They are not as independent as they should be from the government or from regulated entities. Some of the most important decisions they have taken have been controver controversial uh, for being biased in favor of one of the big companies, uh, or they have not uh, challenged, for example, before the Supreme Court, some of the laws, uh, for some of the laws that undermined uh, its autonomy. Uh, but this is, in my point of view, this is not the reason for trying to erase the agency. So what is happening now? Well, the, the government of uh, López Obrador, he repeats, as Valeria said, he repeats all the time that we don't need this type of agencies. We need the money, not the, not the agencies. So Ricardo Monreal, the senator's leader of Morena, Morena is a, the part of López Obrador uh, submitted last year a legislative initiative that proposed the disappearance of three independent agencies, COFESE, IFT, and the CRE, the, the Energetic uh, Agency, and the creation of a new one with all these uh, faculties combined, like a super agency. But after this brilliant idea that uh, fortunately didn't go through, López Obrador simply said, let's disappear all the independent agencies and take back all the, the, the attributions to the corresponding ministries. In other words, let's go back 30 years to the past and return to make discretional decisions they don't like check and balances. However, luckily for us, for do that, it could be necessary to modify our constitution. So it, it, we need a, a, a special majority and Morena does not have this majority. And uh, uh, we have this new treatment, the CUSMA, the TEMEC, with Canada and the US, and Mexico could be violating this agreement if, if it disappears all the agencies. Nevertheless, they are undermining its autonomy, the IFT and all the independent agency, by, for example, appointing low profile functionaries and commissioners that are attached or compromised with the current regime, reducing its budget, attacking its image and social legitimation. So to finalize my, my, my first words, I could say that yes, IFT has deficiencies, but these deficiencies should not lead us to disappear the agency, but to improve it. Why should we think that going backwards 30 years is going to take us to a better place? For me, it's absurd. These are my first ideas. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marta. Thanks, Irene. 
Um, so we'll move on to Miguel. Um, I'm going to ask you the exact same questions, but on COFESE this time. So the Federal Economic Competition Com Commission. Um, so essentially, what's its purpose? What's the overall ills it was designed to remedy? Um, and what have been its general deficiencies? If you could uh, start there, and then we'll, we'll get into some more discussion afterwards. Thanks, Miguel. Yes, thank you, Marta. Uh, it's great to be here with you. Thank you for the Canadian Council of the Americas for the invitation and, and, and IMCO, of course. Um, I'm very happy to share the floor with so distinguished colleagues. Um, first of all, we have to ask ourselves, uh, why does COFESA exist? And it exists because it, it, we need somebody to protect competition in, in Mexico. And why do you need to protect competition? Because competition benefits all of us uh, by keeping prices low and quality and choice of goods and services high. You know, monopolies, cartels, which are the agreements between competitors to reduce the supply and raise prices. And uh, dominant firms do uh, precisely that. They reduce the supply of goods and services and that creates the, uh, the, the prices go up, the, the rising of prices. So if you have supply, the prices will go down, but if you have less supply, then prices will uh, go, go up. Um, so COFESE is an important part uh, of, of the economy of any uh, of Mexico, of course, and any competition authority, it's an important part of any any country. Cofese, in particular, it, in particular, it has the power to uh, fight cartel conduct. That is, uh, fight those companies that are making agreements to fix uh, prices and reduce the supply of services and products. And also, it has the power to uh, investigate and find uh, the abuse of dominant positions. You know, where that's, that is when a big company with substantial market power, that it's the power to define prices and supply in the market, um, will use that power to eliminate competition and deter the entry of, of new competitors. And that, that causes a lot of problems in, in markets. It also has the, the duty to review uh, mergers and acquisitions, and to prevent an anti-competitive mergers and acquisition. So COFESE will review the mergers and acquisitions and block deals that will create a dominant player or that will reduce or facilitate anti-competitive uh, practices. But that's not the only thing that COFESE does. They, it, they also have the power to declare the lack of effective com uh, competition in a certain market so that regulators can uh, uh, fix uh, official prices and avoid problems for consumers. They also have the power to declare the existence of essential facilities and uh, provide guidance for the regulation. And uh, they have an, another very important power that is uh, to issue recommendations on regulation that can affect competition in certain markets. And give me, give, let me give you some examples of the things that COFESE has done. For example, uh, uh, very recently, they uh, fined the pension fund managers, Afores, with $55 million for making agreements to limit the transfer of retire retirement accounts from one manager to another. They also have uh, fined uh, Coca-Cola distributors for denying products to small uh, stores uh, if they sold the competitor's uh, brand. And we have a very similar case in the beer market. Those are very important markets in Mexico. Uh, so they try to avoid exclusive dealings uh, when they are a form of abuse of dominance. They also recently block a very important transaction between Walmart and Corner Shop. Corner Shop is a, a buy delivery uh, application that, uh, and Cofese denied this transaction because they say that they could not guarantee a level playing field for rival retailers whose customers use the application to order groceries and other goods. So these interventions are, are very, very important. Now we know that COFESE has deficiencies. Um, COFESE, of course, needs to launch more, more proofs, more investigations in its markets. It's urgent that they do so, particularly uh, at this moment where we have a, a, a sanitary crisis and economic crisis. And our economy is very concentrated. So 
Markets are prone to cartel conduct or to the abuse of the dominant position. So the role of COFESE is very important, but they need to have more investigations. They also need to speed up their analysis of, of digital markets. We are way behind uh, other jurisdictions. We are way behind, of course, uh, Canada and the US. So we need to, uh, to be more efficient in, in, in analyzing digital markets. COFESE has launched a new the digital markets directorate. They have a, 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 a proof right now, an investigation on digital advertising, but uh, we need them to speed up the process and stop the quarrels with the IFT regarding this issue. They need to work together on that issue. That, that is very important. Even the OECD has uh, advised them to, to do that. Um, we need to reduce the time of investigations. Two years, it's what it takes to do uh, any sort of investigation, uh, competition investigation. That's too much. Uh, we need to, to I mean, they, they need to speed up the, the investigations. And uh, also, I believe that they, they it will be a very good if the constitution could be changed, not to disappear them <laughs> like the current government wants, but to give them the power to initiate constitutional claims against regulation that affects competition and of course that affects the consumers. So now uh, you have referred that the current administration has considered that COFESE has not delivered and has and cost too much. And that it that is not true, of course. COFESE costs $25 million a year and has created tangible benefits of up to $1.2 billion to consumers since 2014 in just 35 relevant cases of a thousand that they have resolved. And by the way, 25 million is what Pemex uh, loses in 15 hours. So <laughs> it's nothing. And without any benefit for consumers, uh, this has been expressed by Hannah Palacios, the president of, of COFESE in a recent team interview. COFESE in five years has imposed more than $300 million in fines and has overseen more than a thousand transactions. Uh, the president has proposed that the Ministry of Economy should be the antitrust watchdog and reduce the supposed cost of, of COFESE. But in my opinion, that will turn an independent regulator uh, te and technical regulator into a political body. And that will be very dangerous for consumers in Mexico. That, that would be my, my first uh, intervention. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Miguel. Um, before we go over to a sort of more general conversation between all of the panelists, I do wanna invite Maria, if you could um, just, I'd invite you to speak to more specifically with, with INAI, the, the issues concerning uh, personal data protection. Um, if you could speak to that a little bit, just to make sure that our listeners know that other section of, of their responsibility. Maria? Thank you very much. I, I think it's uh, very important to say that uh, while the FI was born uh, to grant access to public information, information from the government, uh, once we start working, we uh, face uh, with the, the reality that the information acts, it has limits. And one of the limits is uh, to grant or not to grant access to the private information of the individuals that any government has necessarily. So we start uh, drawing some, some kind of fine lines between the information, the public information and the information, uh, the data protection of the individuals that uh, has the government. That's how it becomes uh, the authority for uh, data protection, not just for the government, but also for the private sector. So now the, it, it's kind of complex. The, the INAI has like three different um, attributions. First, and, and maybe most important, to grant access to the information of the government and all the, the how they spend the money and uh, how they uh, took some kind of decisions. Then to protect the data 
from the individuals that the own government has, like for example, all, all the all the health system, uh, granting uh, access to to your own um, medical uh, file, and third, uh, the private that the the data the private data that has the uh, private sector, like for example the uh, banks, the uh, big stores, and of course, uh, uh, internet and, and all of that. I think uh, it has been equally important in our society to grant access to information and to grant privacy to the citizens. So this is, these are three different functions, uh, very, very important. Thank you, Martha, for, for the question. No, thank you. Thanks for explaining that. Um, so we will open it up now to a sort of more general uh, conversation with all the panelists. To start, um, I just want to ask any of the panelists, and Valeria, you might have some comments on, on what each of the, the panelists spoke, but in general, everybody has mentioned sort of the, the current government's plans and what they have, what they've discussed pertaining to each of the institutions. Um, sort of they've they've discussed in internalizing into the ministries the, the duties that are within the institutions themselves. Valeria, could you comment more on this and sort of expand maybe? And then we'll lead it off to, to each of the other panelists to interject on that point as well. Sure, of course. Well, Miguel is an expert in, in, in antitrust policy, Irene, regarding, uh, regarding telecommunications. And of course, Maria knows about everything about access to information. Giving back these functions to their, their I mean, quote unquote, their uh, corresponding government institutions or government cabinets, it's just like the complete opposite of what we want. We want autonomous institutions. It's like if we give the central bank, uh, you know, go back to Hacienda maybe or to the Minister of Finance, that's exactly what we don't want. We want to separate institutions for many reasons. First of all, we need technical expertise. We need technical expertise. That's very important. And unfortunately, and I think this is a very shameful moment in history, we are not validating or we are questioning the relevance of the technical issues or the, or the technical experts. So being an expert on, some, on something, it's not well seen in this moment in time. I, 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 of course, don't agree with that. And in this particular commissions, I mean, when I hear Irene speak, sometimes I don't even understand her. You know, what's she talking about? I remember when they were discussing the rights that, I don't even remember the number, the names, but they were talking about some technical technicalities that are not easy, easily translated to the general people and me being general people, all being the general people. So we need experts. We need experts that know exactly what they are talking about. And we do not need to, to make that translation to everybody. We just have to know that these institutions have the mandate to, to bear for the welfare to see for the welfare of the of the Mexican consumers for the Mexican citizens and I think we are we're switching the the rhetoric we're switching the rhetoric going to a money issue to austerity issues that are not really in discussion here um, and then again I think that these institutions especially the one pertaining to antitrust policy COFESE have many issues that have to translate more to the general public and have to be much more efficient in their ruling, as Miguel was mentioning. Recently, we had a, a sanction that the COFESA made for some bad practices in the bond market, in the secondary bond market in Mexico. And the sanction raised a lot of anger in many people because the sanction was that the monetary sanction was at some point lights or some low maybe. And Confessor received a very high amount of criticism because of that, because we don't understand the law that, that Confessor has to abide by. That is, you have to be consistent, uh, the punishment or the fee has to be, the, the fine has to be consistent with the damage that was done to the market. So I think 
some of these institutions, and I think Confessor has been doing a very good job, but it has it has not been enough. Um, so we have to be very clear on what we want to defend, uh, because the rhetoric is there and it's against it's against institutions. Um, we, I think that the real issue that the president doesn't like more than the money or more than is that he does not have control over them. Uh, Lopez Obrador uh, wants, he likes to have control about everything, control on everything. It's a very uh, vertical government. Even his own cabinet only responds to him. It's just like uh, employees in a way. Um, and he does not like the checks and balances and the this uh, difference that the, these autonomous institutions do not respond to him. So I think we ha we do not have to deviate from the main reasoning. It's not about money. It's not about austerity. It's about control. The president wants to have absolute control. Um, and we need to tackle that. Sincerely, Marta, I don't know how these institutions has to have to do to survive. You know, it's, they're fighting for their own survival. Okay, thanks, Valeria. Irene, can I ask you to speak more specifically on that same question with, with respect to telecommunications? And I'd also just add to that, um, I think it was you that mentioned the, the that maybe the commissioners and how, how appointing the commissioners might not be very transparent. Um, just sort of, are there ways that you can see um, sort of reforming the, the the IFT rather than dismantling it and what those things might look like. So how, how do you sort of create more transparency in the selection of commissioners and the like? Thanks, Irene. Yeah, of course. I, I couldn't agree more with uh, Valeria about this topic. But about your question, Marta, we're talking about two different worlds. I mean, you're talking about how to improve these organs while in the government they are trying to figure out how to disappear them. So I think it's a su survivor thing now. Uh, we could talk about reforming constitution in order to put more autonomy to these agencies, but it's not real. So uh, we have uh, to face this. We are, uh, I don't want to use the, the word uh, war, but we are in, in, in we, we are seeing how uh, the government, uh, the government that are, is trying to um, destroy the institutions we have because it, it has nothing to do with the, the way they work. They want control, uh, they want uh, austerity. It's not about money, but it's, it's how am, am I gonna spend the money? They want to decide to decide how to spend the money. I'm going to give the money to the people direct, directly, so I'm going to win votes for the next election. And about this uh, uh, technical contempt uh, of this uh, of this government, it's it's very important because we are we're seeing that. Uh, the new uh, functionaries, the, the new employments in the government are more and more less prepared in the technical issues. So it's very concerning. For example, I'm going to give an example. In Mexico City, now we have this problem with the metro, with the subway. Uh, subway doesn't work. Now, because some of the lines does, don't work, because what? What happened? The, the, there was this fire because they didn't maintain, the, they, they, they fire all the technical uh, people that used to work in, in the metro. Why? Because they're saving money to give money to the people. But we are destroying not only institutions, but we are destroying as well uh, the base of the economy, and they don't understand this. So in terms of uh, telecommunications, we have to point out that uh, IFT is not perfect, of course, but it, ha it has been, uh, it has uh, brought us some um, benefits. For example, 
uh, uh, prices had dropped uh, about 40%. It's not, it's not a, a little portion, it's, it's very important. So we have, uh, we have to look at the possibilities. Do, you, do we want to keep uh, this, institu this institute with this, these autonomous agencies? Or we, we're going to, we want to go back uh, to the past and concent concentrate decision. Imagine Carlos Slim and all the Televisa directors sitting in the in front of the secretary of uh, of uh, communications or in front of the president, uh, changing favors in order to get some uh, concessions or or whatever. It is not what a modern state wants. So we don't have to lose control. We don't have to, to, to stop talking about this. Thank you, Irene. Um, Maria, can I ask you to uh, address the same question? Um, sort of what, what is the actual plan uh, if the regulatory body um, is, is disbanded or, or taken apart? What, what is their sort of their backup plan? Will it go into the ministry, into the secretariat? And, and how, what would that actually look like? Um, well, I, I think uh, maybe we are going to disappoint our, our audience because there is not going to be a controversy. I, I cannot agree more. Uh, the argument uh, of the need to save money does not stand by itself. It's, it's actually... A, a, a very lame excuse. I, I can even use a, strong, uh, a stronger word. It's a very stupid excuse. Uh, Valeria used a, a very strong word, right? And he said, destruction of the institutions. He's not talking about transformation. He really tries to destruct the, 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 the institutions. One, uh, one reason is uh, because uh, he disliked, disliked them. It's, it's a very visceral decision. Uh, he hates them. Uh, and the other one, which is more important and more dangerous, is uh, the, the need to uh, concentrate power. Uh, Lopez Obrador is a politician from the 60s or 70s in Mexico. Uh, he is really in love with the idea of, of the uh, president that has, the presidency that has no limits in Mexico. We already experienced that. And we already suffered the consequences of, of, of that. Uh, saying that, I must say that there is a, an important information and I'm not saying that uh, IFT, EFT or COFESE are less important than the INAI, but uh, the INAI has not a correspondent ministry. I mean, uh, the FI is authority, not just for the executive, but for the legislative and the judicial. Uh, and uh, as well for a uh, Freedom of Information Act and uh, Data Protection Act. So you cannot put all these kind of um, uh, responsibilities under one ministry, let alone the conflict of interest that the Secretaría de Función Pública, que is that like the ministry de, of, that control the public administration, uh, will have protecting the information of their own administration in order to not uh, let the people know about uh, uh, when they buy uh, in the wrong way, when they buy with overprice, uh, when they uh, buy uh, directly without making a, a sort of a, a contest, licitacion, uh, but uh, they just buy from one uh, company uh, favoring because they are, uh, his compadres or whatever, uh, or, or they, their associates in business. So I think it's very important. Uh, I remember when, when I was president of the IFI, 
after two years of, of uh, EFI functioning, we measure, and it was true, that the viaticos drop the, the, the expenditure in, in viaticos, money for restaurant, money for travel, etc., cetera, uh, went down uh, around 25% because they didn't want to know that uh, to show a, a, a ticket, a factura, showing that uh, they have some buses at, at, at the meal time or that they went to, to eat with her family uh, or his family uh, on Sunday and, and the government pay for that, which really happened in Mexico, even in 2002, 2004. They drop significantly then the number of aviadores, uh, people that uh, set to work in, in an institute, but actually just receive the payment without uh, having any kind of responsibility. And um, uh, we were able to discover a great number of bureaucrats that uh, false claim to have a, a university degree because when they were asked for the degree of the university, there was no uh, university or the, the Ministry of Education that have re registered this kind of uh, diploma. So there are tangible uh, benefits to have these uh, uh, agencies. Of course, as any institution in the world, not just in Mexico, they can be improved they can have some measures to, to spend less and do more. It is possible, but one thing is to transform it and another thing is to destroy it in order to concentrate power. Irene, you had a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to, to say to Maria that you are right. If I had to choose one of these agencies to survive, I could definitely choose uh, uh, INAI. I mean, it's not a matter to choose, but of course, by far, is the most important. Yeah, it's the only thing I wanted, I wanted to say, yes. Miguel, please. You had a comment. Oh, yes. Uh, well, re regarding the issue of what uh, can these uh, organizations do to send their message but so that the people understand what they are doing and the people defend these, these institutions as, as their own. Uh, one thing, at least for COFESE, I think that COFESE, again, has to focus more on investigations. And um, the studies and opinions that they uh, provide are great and they are very useful. Uh, but nothing sends a better message to markets than a, a, a fine imposed to a cartel that it's uh, raising prices and affecting consumers. Um, they, they, they have a, a, a very good um, uh, media um, uh, personnel that help them to, to provide information to the public, but, but still they need uh, more investigations and to explain better their investigations and to be more quick to, de to decide more quickly on, on the on the on the things that are affecting consumers let me put you an example they they are they are they are fighting cartels in the tortilla market which is a very important market i mean it's it's all mexicans we all eat tortillas and we have cartels all over the place on tortillas and they are fighting them and they are uh, doing this but they are not explaining why this is so important and i think that they have to do that uh, better so and, and this is, of course, part of the of democracy. All, all parts of government, of parts of the state have to explain their, their mission. And, and I think that with more investigations and explaining what happened and why they are finding somebody, um, uh, they, they will send a better, a better message. Great, thank you so much, Miguel. Um, on that, I'm actually gonna switch over to some of the audience questions that we've received. And I think Miguel actually just started answering one of these. Um, so I'm just gonna continue it and I'll ask Irene to, to pipe in first. Um, it's from the ambassador of Sweden to Mexico, Ambassador Thunborg. And her question is, public independent agencies must be able to explain their mission and work to the general public. This is part of the public mandate in any democracy. 
it is part of their accountability. Could the panelists comment on how this can be improved as regards to the agencies and other agencies um, in question? Um, so Irene, could I ask you to speak to that uh, with regards to the IFT? Of course, uh, thank you. Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, Mrs. Ambassador, uh, I think you are right. I think they're failed in this uh, duty because, for example, as Valeria said, telecommunications is a very technical issue. So how to uh, explain to people uh, the importance, for example, to have a, a, an, an independent agency or how to explain how interconnection uh, regulation works. Uh, it's, it's very difficult and I think that they, they could be better because they they are they're sort of fail with this thing uh but also government i mean they should be um they should be together uh but now we we see this uh, conf confrontation between the agencies and the government so they're trying to undermine their image it's not a good thing, but I, I, I completely ag agree that they, they should be working in translate. What are they doing to improve the, the, the life of the people, uh, the day-to-day the -day life uh, of the people? It's, it's not only this, um, this um, heaven work, you know, very, very complicated to understand. And this is one of the of the of the things that are uh, affecting uh, their their image. I think it is is one of the of the things. Thank you. Valeria, you had a comment on this? Yes, just a brief a brief comment to try to contribute to Mrs. Um, Anika, the ambassador, Mrs. Su uh, ambassador question. Uh, recently, I don't know if what it was, I don't know, three weeks ago when the president started uh, mentioning EFT and attacking very harshly EFT, the EFT launched a very, uh, very simple infography on Twitter, very simple. It was just like a PowerPoint slide. And in that very simple slide, you could see how much have the cellular tariffs gone down, how much more competition there was, how cheaper, how much cheaper the, our smartphones have become. And those are the thing in Mexico, only, I mean, we have a lot of work to do, but we have a very high penetration of cell phones or smartphones. And if something is very related to the personal and daily life of every citizen is our phone. So that very small slide that the EFT produced in just a couple of hours uh, to respond to the president's attack, I think it was very useful to the conversation. I don't know, it's a very difficult time because polarization is so deep that whatever you say, I mean, you're, people are not listening, we are not listening to understand, we're listening only to reply. So when these institutions come uh, and try to defend what they do, immediately they face an attack. Uh, so it's very difficult, but I completely agree that they and we, as a, as a civil society institution, we need to work on the importance of these institutions and to try to translate the importance that they have to the common people, to our, I mean, we are the common people, to everybody, so that we understand what these institutions do. Wonderful. Maria, can I um, invite you to, to comment on this for Inai? And also, I guess generally, I mean, from what Irene was saying and what you just mentioned, Valeria, the question is, is how to go about doing that? Like, how do the institutions themselves, is it a, you know, PR marketing move? A how, I mean, rather than being reactionary and to describe and so that the public does know what the institution does, just uh, get your thoughts on, on, on what that could look like or sort of suggestions about how that could be done. Um, Maria? Well, uh, I really want uh, to thank you, the ambassador, because the, the, the comment was really uh, important, the, 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 the question. I, before I, I respond your question, Marta, I want to tell the, 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 the public and uh, a history of my life uh, which is true, as, as you can see from the panelists, is uh, by far I'm the oldest one. 
and uh, and not just because I not I don't dye my 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 hair. Uh, I was married 42 years ago. When I was married, uh, an apartment in Mexico City, uh, the price was higher if, if it has a telephone line uh, because it was impossible to get a telephone line. You have to, to stand in line to make a queue of almost five years in order to get a telephone at your home. Of, of course, there was no, no, no cellular phones. Uh, but we have a very weak memory and we don't realize uh, the importance that uh, now EFT has in this kind of services as well as to uh, improve competitions about uh, within businesses uh, as Kofi said do. Uh, what should uh, the uh, INAI do? I think they have to communicate uh, what was the reality before information and uh, uh, access to information of the government and what uh, can uh, we ac have access now? I already mentioned uh, salaries from, from the people that works in, in, the, in, the, um, in the government, but uh, the, just the idea that the public contracts are uh, public, that has had an impact on corruption. Even though we have a very big problem in corruption, but institutions like IMCO, Mexican Transparency, uh, Impunidad Cero, and another uh, um, important NGOs were, uh, were be, uh, it will be impossible to imagine that they do uh, have done the work that they have done in the last uh, 10, 15 years in Mexico, almost 20. So uh, I, I do agree there, there is a lack of communication. There is a, 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 either the, the effort is, uh, uh, hasn't been a, a, enough or it hasn't been very useful. And it definitely both, the, no, no, both, there are three. The, the three institutions that are now discussing have to think about that. Thank you, Maria. Um, we've got another question here that I'd like to move on to. Miguel, if you wanna add something to this, uh, to that same question, please do when I when I go to you. Um, but we do have another question that uh, came in, and it's essentially um, sort of what are the what are the legal processes that can be taken? What are the the ways in which um, the dismantling or the dissolving of the these institutions? What are the legal uh, avenues that are available? To, to stop that or to, or to at least keep some of the things outside of, of the different uh, ministries or, or the like. Miguel, if, did you wanna comment on that? Yes, uh, well, the, the legal process to, to, to dismantle these, these institutions requires a change in the constitution. And right now the, the government does not have a majority in the Senate. So uh, they will have to convince the opposition they, they need 11 senators to change the constitution um, and maintain their uh, their majority on the house and the, the lower house in the house of, of, of diputados in Congress in, in the Cámara de Diputados. So right now it, it will not be, um, I, I, I don't think they have the votes to, to do that, but uh, they could get them. They could convince the, somebody in the opposition to vote with them and destroy the regulatory state that, that we have been building during these 30 years. And also there, there, there have been some mentions in the media about the, the, the breaching of, of PEMEC, of the, of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, and that, that of course is more clear regarding the IFT. It's not that clear regarding COFESE. Um, how, however, I think that if they were to disappear, then uh, monopolies will thrive in Mexico and uh, decisions will be political. And there will of course be violations of national treatment, 
most favored nation of treatment, fair and equitable treatment, and the investor state uh, chapter that we have in, in, in this agreement will, of course, uh, be a mechanism that foreign investors could use to defend themselves against these decisions. Unfortunately, that will not be something that Mexicans could use. It will only be available for foreigners. So that's that's a terrible thing to do. Um, and, and well, those are the, the, the legal processes that, that I, I can see. And but the most important part, I think, that for the moment is that we speak speak up to defend these institutions because they are important for all of us, and 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 we need to defend them publicly uh, in any way that we can. Perfect, Irene. Did you want to comment about what some of the sort of international trade agreements or anything? I know you had mentioned the. TMEC or the USMCA um, or the NAFTA 2.0, but if yeah. you want to mention. <laughs> yeah, um. Thank you, Marita. Uh, yeah, just to add some of some ideas to uh, what Miguel said. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, mentioned um, we have to, to change the constitution. And uh, by now, we don't have the votes. We're going to have elections, uh, as everybody knows, in June. Uh, to renew uh, Camara de Diputados, uh, so ho hopefully they're, they're not going to get the majority. But if they, if, if, if they get the majority, uh, then we know they're going to be more, they're going to be tougher in trying to get these 11 uh, votes of the, uh, senators of the senators of the opposition. So we have this political thing that is, you know, is, is alive and we have to, to take care of that. But on the other hand, this is the, the institution uh, defense. But on the other hand, we have all the time um, these um, decisions that uh, attack attack to uh, attack the autonomy of these organs, like the um, uh, uh, energetic politics from Sener, from the Energy Ministry. It, it attacked the uh, the uh, um, faculties of the. CRE of the regulatory in energy, but we will have uh, as well uh, some uh, in, intents to undermine autonomy by each of the decisions, not only the institution itself, but their resolutions by some resolutions by the government. So what can we do? Well, this is very important. These institutions, have the power to fill a, a controversy. Um, controversy uh, it, it, um, uh, it's uh, how how good I say this in, in English is um, uh, controversy constitutional constitutional controversy in order to restore their faculties because it, if they consider their faculty uh, their faculties are being undermined they 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 will they, they can do that but if they they don't defend their faculties we're going to have problems and what i see i don't know the, the the rest of the of the team now see the same thing but i don't see they are willing to defend very firmly uh, their their um, uh, their faculties. So that worries me very much because they are uh, they are. Um, of course, it's, it's not easy to have a president uh, speaking every morning against you. No, I, I understand that, but uh, they, they have to be they have to be firm. Otherwise, uh, they're going to end uh, disappearing. Wonderful. Thanks, Irene. Um, Maria, did you want to comment uh, a bit more on the constitutional controversy that this would create? Yes, I think in, in this part, it's going to be very, very important, the, the, the role of, of the opposition as well as the Supreme Court. And, and this can uh, be emphasized enough because I think the opposition's is acting like like 
oh, well, I, I cannot do anything, which is not true. They, they should take responsibility that there is not going to be a constitutional reform without them in, in the Senado, in the Senate, uh, and, and they have to fight in that. Uh, the, other, uh, the other thing that bothers me quite a lot, I don't know if, if the panelists will agree with me or no, uh, or not, is the, the um, subjugation, uh, 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 how the, the Supreme Court and the current pre presidents of the Supreme Court has lost uh, independence from uh, the executive. Uh, there has been many, many years, I think at least 20, 25 years, that we haven't seen a president of the Supreme Court so uh, willingly to, to be nice with the president of Mexico. Uh, it was very hard in Mexico to build an in the, uh, uh, judicial power independent and uh, now I think many people uh, in, the, in the audience, and of I cannot guess uh, of the panelists of, uh, also, we are worried about the, the, the president of the Supreme Court. And, and those are really uh, bad news uh, for Mexico. And another thing, sorry. No, uh, I, I do agree I, and that the def with uh, uh, Irene that the defense that some of these institutions are doing uh, has not been very, very intelligent. Uh, it seems uh, uh, at some point, especially for the INAI, that they are defending their own salary or their own power and not a right of the citizens. And I think that's either poor communication or, or not a very clever way to, to, to focus and to, and to uh, make a, a, a counter-argument counter, counter to the president. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Miguel, did you have a comment on that same topic? Well, uh, regarding the Supreme Court, yes, of course, we all are worried about the president of the Supreme Court independence of the executive branch. Um, however, I think that uh, in the case of COFESE, they have been uh, very good litigators concerning uh, constitutional controversies. They recently won uh, a controversy against the Ministry of Energy, where the Ministry of Energy was changing some rules uh, that will uh, give more um, uh, advantage to the, to the, to the, the Mexican um, uh, electricity company that it's owned by the government and um, uh, and against uh, clean energies. The Co COFESE started a, a controversy uh, stating that that will affect their powers and uh, many people including myself we, we did not believe that that will go through the the Supreme Court because it seems more like a, a sort of a anti-constitutional uh, uh, claim rather than a controversy of, of uh, between uh, the faculties, between two powers. But anyway, the, the, the Supreme Court uh, decided one of the salas, the Supreme Court is divided into two salas and one of them, uh, not the whole uh, ministries, but one, uh, one of these salas decided in favor of Confesse. And this is a very important precedent. Uh, of course, the, the government will not like that and they uh, will uh, fight against uh, Confesse maybe uh, with more energy. But it's a, it's a good present, and I think that uh, they should explain it better to the public so that they know that they were fighting this not for their salaries, not because they uh, want to stay there as commissioners, but because this is good for consumers and that it will avoid the raising of prices in, in the electricity sector. Great, thank you, Miguel. I am cognizant of the time, so um, unless uh, either Irene or Maria um, have another comment to make. Um, I will let Miguel have the last word there. Um, Irene or Maria, did you want to make another quick comment, closing comment? No? Okay. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Irene, Miguel, Maria, as well as Valeria and the rest of the INCO staff. Um, 
Irene, please go ahead. Sorry, yes, I want to make a closing comment. I, I thought it was about the, the thing was uh, Miguel was comment, commenting. No, so yeah, just a few words uh, to say that uh, we're living very tough moments in Mexico regarding the new regime, uh, regarding the, the, the willingness to, to destroy institutions. Uh, I, I'd like to, to just illustrate this with an example. Imagine you have, um, I don't know, you have a water filtration in one of the bathrooms in your house. And uh, the, the, the normal thing you're going to do is you're going to fix the pipes, you're going to fix the wall, and you're going to move on. But here, as uh, President Lopez Obrador says that these organs don't work, uh, what Lopez Obrador would do with the filtration in the bathroom, he would call a bulldozer and destroy the house. So that's what, what we are living. Why destroying the house for a water filtration? Why don't uh, just uh, fix the pipes? So um, we, we're facing that in Mexico, unfortunately. It's very sad to, to, to see that. And for me, it takes uh, years and years to build uh, reliable institutions, but two minutes to destroy them. So let's try to keep this dialogue. Let's try to keep these efforts to uh, avoid the destructions of our institutions in Mexico. Thank you for the invitation. No problem. Thank you, Irene. I think on that note, uh, Maria, you want another comment there? Please. Be very, very brief. I think what is at stake is democracy, and that is not an overstatement. And uh, uh, what is in danger are the protection of fundamental rights in Mexico. It, it is as, as bad as that, not less. Thank you. OK. Thanks with that, I will close. I will just finish off by saying that this is the first of um, many conversations that I'm sure that we at the CCA, as well as our partners at IMCO, will continue having on these issues in Mexico. Um, and hopefully as well as there will, um, on other institutions, because we do recognize that these aren't the only three that, um, that have been discussed in the public fora. Thank you again to all of our panelists today and as well as our event partners, IMCO. Um, we'll see you all soon. Thanks so much. Thank you to everybody. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.